Very special guest on today's Locked On 49ers draft expert, lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus, draft grade for the San Francisco 49ers, where they did great, maybe some things they could have done better in the 2024 NFL draft. Coming at you right now. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers. Brian Peacock here with you. Croc not here. He's traveling, but uh, I've got a pretty solid replacement here. Lead draft analyst at Pro Football Focus. Former alum of the Locked On Podcast Network, none other than Trevor Sykema. You can find him on Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey. Uh, you can find all of his work at PFF, the uh, NFL Stock Exchange Podcast, which is fantastic. Of course, I am Brian Peacock, your everyday host here at BD Peacock on Twitter. Thanks, everybody, for making this your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We love our everydayers. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase. Terms apply. Trevor, welcome back to the network, man. How are you doing? Big things, uh, more expensive haircuts now since you moved on to bigger and better things at PFF. Love your work, and uh, you did a fantastic job once again this draft season. I appreciate it, Brian. It's always good to be with you. Uh, truly, the only thing that has changed is the haircuts got it more expensive. That's it. Like everything else is exactly the same from when I was doing lockdown NFL draft with Ben and John. Um, yeah, replacing re- replacing Croc here. Like I can't play corner as well as he can, but we'll see if I can talk 49ers as well as he can. So I'm excited to talk a little ball and some draft. We are going to talk a little corner here. Renardo Green, second round pick for the 49ers. Real quick, though, just with your draft season, and I know a lot of this stuff is in the books, and now you're doing a lot of post draft stuff. Do you get a little vacation? When do you start diving into 2025 draft tape? Yeah, so first, a couple weeks after the draft, a lot of people, like this fine show, you know, would like to have me on and and hear my thoughts about how the draft actually went, which I really appreciate. Very blessed that that is the case, that people actually care what I think about the NFL draft. Um, But, you know, end of May is normally, you know, I get a couple of weeks in the end of May, and summer is a little bit more flexible for me, which is nice, but... Man, when June comes rolling around, I'm going to be honest, like, I get the itch again. And we start summer scouting, and we start watching a lot of these guys. We start putting together the PFF big boards so you guys can be ready when the college football season drops, when the NFL season starts. You know, whenever you want to get into the NFL draft, we're going to have it ready for you. So that all starts in June. Thankfully, the Atlanta Falcons had the big wow moment in the first round of the NFL draft this year, or else it might have been the 49ers that picked 31. Uh, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a prospect that was so universally liked but not loved like Ricky Pearsall and kind of everyone had like a second round grade on him, but nobody had him in the first round and he did sneak into the end of the first round of the 49ers at pick 31. Did you think that was a reach there for Ricky Pearsall? How do you like that pick? And and what do you think Ricky Pearsall would bring to the San Francisco 49ers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit of a reach, but it, it's sort of like everybody wanted to get their hands on this wide receiver class, and that was when a big wide receiver run was happening, right? And I think that you felt like that was coming. You know, that first and second tier of receivers were starting to come off the board, and now things were really starting to move fast with the receiver class. So San Francisco ends up getting the guy that they that they wanted to bring in. And look, I know that they say, hey, we, we, we're we we're trying to make it work between Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel and keep all those guys here. I wonder if the Ricky Pearsall deal was a long-term deal maybe not like okay that means a trade with these guys is imminent but okay maybe not a long-term deal maybe in a couple of seasons anyways they might be moving on from one of these guys you've already got Pearsall in the building he'd have a couple years under his belt in the system at that point and he's pretty versatile receiver man like for as much as I'm a draft guy. I'm also a Florida Gator alumnus. I graduated from the University of Florida, and so I watch basically every right. single uh, Florida Gator game that there is. And so, you know, Ricky, I think, was really inconsistent in 2022 when Anthony Richardson was the quarterback. And this past year with Graham Mertz, he just had a lot better chemistry. He was a lot more confident. Um, I, he's really strong at the catch point. He runs really nice routes. I mean, I, I think that certainly he's he's a good enough athlete. I, I, I think that it's hard to find a player – I mean, outside of Jaden Daniels, right, who was probably a day three pick and they vaults himself up to number two overall. It's hard to find a player that helped themselves more throughout the last calendar year for the draft process than Ricky Pearsall. I mean, it was his best year of his career in college this past year. Showed what he could showcase, or showed what he could bring to the table as a true emphasis in the passing game and a wide receiver one for Florida. Uh, then he goes to the Senior Bowl. 
dominates two straight days so much so that he doesn't even have to practice that third day. Doesn't even have to play in the game. Um, goes to the combine. It's a fantastic combine. He's a lot more athletic, I would say, in a linear sense than people thought that he was going to be. I think that people always were like, all right, yeah, he's going to dominate the, the agility drills with the quickness, but, you know, is he that explosive? Well, yes, he actually is. And so it's hard to think that like every step of the way there was somebody who was handling their business better than Ricky Pearsall was. So uh, it felt like this was always possible. I thought that he was going to be a second round pick, but uh, hey, San Francisco obviously saw him as a versatile receiver who can maybe really help them in the long run. By the way, his former college teammate and quarterback, Jaden Daniels back at Arizona State. That's true. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, it's really, that's one of the things to think about. And by the way, like if, if you're trying to find that guy next year in 2025, that's the sneaky late first round pick that nobody sees coming. Find someone who just knocks the 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 postseason, the pre-draft stuff out of the park. If they double up with an awesome senior bowl and then destroy the combine, that that's kind of the player you're going to look for. And I, I think Ricky Purcell wasn't quite as surprising as someone like Cole Strange might have been, who also had a nice pre-draft uh, season uh, in, what, 2022 draft? Yes. Um, I so. Yeah. yeah uh, and... But, you know, Pearsall was like, he, he was just a really good prospect. And and I think he's a really good fit for the 49ers. I don't see the downfield runaway speed, the 4 4 Because you see someone like uh, Troy Franklin, who fell a little bit late third round or early fourth round pick in the draft. And they both ran 4 4 And it's like, you see them run routes and it couldn't be any different. Like one guy's got crazy deep speed mm-hmm. and the other guy's got crazy short area quicks, but doesn't have the deep speed. So I feel like that 10-yard split, the first 20 yards... Um, you know, the, the, that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting on, on Ricky Pearsall's four, four, one. Cause I don't know if I see on tape, him running away from guys down the field, even though he does, you know, obviously show some athleticism. I think he's got some vertical ability, right? But it's just, it, it it's to, to your point, it, it's more short area explosiveness. That's, and that's how he, his game, it's how you build this game, right? It, it's not going to be this, oh, he ran a four, four, one. Let's make him this vertical receiver. Well, I mean, if you're doing that, why are you drafting him, right? You're going to draft him to be that short and intermediate type of really good route runner, consistent separator, yards after catch player. And to me, when you, when you talk about that four, four, one speed, it is more of a yards after catch thing than it is uh let's, let's run, you know, deep posts and go balls and things like that. Let's get behind the defense and just stretch the field very, really vertically. It's more of like a, uh, we can get the ball in his hands pretty quickly. He can become a playmaker. And then we start to see that long speed show up. So that's the way that I saw the long speed. Yeah. And, and I, and I love the the ability to not have to force him into any certain role can probably play a wide receiver three, sort of a slot role as a rookie. You move on from Debo next year. He's the Z you move him around, keep him away from some of those press uh, alignments so so he doesn't get jammed up at the line of scrimmage and get him some free releases and use those quick. So that's how I envision Ricky Pearsall fitting in with the 49ers, uh, especially in the year two and beyond. Uh, age is an interesting question I've had, and and I think these draft classes with the extra COVID year, we've seen so many super seniors, fifth, sixth year seniors. And Ricky Pearsall, you mentioned how he was helped so much. Like when he was 21, would he have been a first round pick? That You know, there's no way. Um, but he's going to be a 24 year old rookie. How do you, when you're doing your draft grades, how do you look at two prospects? One that might be a true junior, a redshirt sophomore, and is, was 20 years old the last time he's on a field, versus a guy who's much more developed and spent three more years in college, like a Ricky Pearsall. How does that change in your rankings? And how do you um, do you, do you factor that in even at all, or do you just look at the last tape and what they are now and look at what they maybe could become? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an interesting question because people talk about age all the time. And um, I think age is more of a positive than it is a negative. And I, I don't think people talk about it that way, right? Like when people talk about age for a prospect, they typically want to just talk about the negative, right? They want to talk about, oh, like he's an older prospect where if they're an older prospect, but they're better for it, then I don't really care that much. I mean, the shelf life in the NFL is 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 short anyways when you look at averages and even for like best case scenario stuff, like a couple contracts, like two contracts from a guy, it's hard to think that they're getting a lot more than that. They're just the NFL is a it's a tough game for a lot of these guys. And so, you know, if a player's really good, like people ask me this question about Michael Penix Jr. all the time, right? They go like, ah, you know, Michael Penix, he's gonna, he's gonna be 24, like Bo Nix, right? People are like, oh, Bo Nix is gonna be 24 what do I care? <laughs> right? Like they're good. <laughs> like they, they were in college longer, but they became good. I mean, can you imagine if Michael Penix Jr. came out as a junior? 
Can you imagine if if uh, if Bo Nix came out as like a true junior, just leaving Auburn instead of going to uh, of uh, instead of going to Oregon? He probably wouldn't be in the NFL. But instead, he got to go to a program that really honed in on what he does well, kind of taught him more about himself, probably, and his game and how it could succeed at a high level. And now he's that kind of player. Like, that's the kind of player he is. So quarterback's a little bit different because I don't really care about age because these guys can play in their late 30s anyways. But to me, everybody focuses so much on like, oh, this prospect's old. That means he's bad. No, I think it's kind of the other way around. You should look at it like, oh, this prospect's young and he's really good. That's a big bonus. I think it is much more of a bonus for young players that stand out than it is a negative for older, more developed players that are like good football players. Like If we're talking about guys that are in the top 100, that's how I view it. If you are younger and you have, have, have a lower uh, breakout age success, great. That's a big positive for you. But I don't really see it as that big of a negative if you don't have it. You just don't have that bonus to you. Now, like when you get into day three, sure, do you want to be taking a a 24-year-old like depth piece who might be like a practice squad player? No. You're going to take the younger guy. You're going to want to take a guy who's 20 or 21 or something like that just because they're like they're younger and you keep them on the practice squad. They can develop their second contract. They'll be younger for it. And like, again, those elements still exist. But when you talk about guys in the top 100, like that's – that's often like what they are already. So are they good or not? So that, that's, that's, that's the age conversation to me. It's much more of a positive when it's a good thing than it is a negative when it's not. That's just my take. Yeah, I'd much rather have a 29-year-old player entering his second contract that's worth a second contract Who's good? than a, than a right. 25-year-old that you don't want to sign anyway. Right, right, right. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes it is a little bit of that, you know, like the family guy meme where you look at a guy who's 24 and is exactly, it's kind of exactly what you want on the team or a 21 year old who's not quite there, but like, maybe he'll get there. He's got maybe like you could say he's got potential in a high ceiling and it's the family guy meme where he goes, yeah, a boat's a boat, but the mystery box could be anything. It could even be a boat. (laughs) And it's like. Just take the boat. Like just, <laughs> just draft the player that you know is good. Not every situation is like that, but um, yeah, that's that's kind of my approach to to age metrics. All right, more with Trevor Sick. I'm a lead analyst to PFF. We're talking 49ers draft. What is his favorite pick from this draft class next? Today's episode of Locked On 49ers is brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small, and certain things can really start to get to you. It's so important to let that out. Don't let that small thing become the big thing, especially to someone who's unbiased in your life. It is important to be able to speak to somebody who can help you and walk you through these situations. And, you know, whether it's uh, work or personal life, whatever it is, life can come at you fast. And sometimes you just need that weekly check-in with the therapist. Make sure you're hitting the goals in the short term to help you get to where you want to go in the long term every week and therapy can be different for everyone most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams as big as those might feel sometimes uh and and as passionate as we might feel about those things it's important to get the things off your chest every once in a while if you're thinking of starting therapy give better help a try it's entirely online designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule visit betterhelp.com slash locked on to get 10 percent off your first month that's betterhelp h-e-l-p.com slash locked on All right, moving on beyond round one here. Did you have a favorite selection? Was it Ricky Pearsall? W- which pick did you like the most from this 2024 draft from the San Francisco 49ers? Um, you know, obviously, I, I love the Shanahan bit at this point where he just takes a running back in round three or four, no matter what the team yeah. looks like. But no, I, that's that's not my favorite. But I did I did have to bring up Garendo because I do think it's hilarious that Shanahan would just like every year, no matter what the running back room looks like. Does Schrader, does this, and this is the other the Shanahan meme is, the, the next running back ends up being better from the same draft class, whether he's drafted or not. Do you think Schrader becomes a better running back in the NFL than Garendo, the, the Missouri back? Wait a second. They yeah, got- they find him in undrafted free agency. He went for Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Let's go. Cody Schrader was one of my, like, my guy day three players because – he will give you. I, do you know anything about like Cody Schrader's background? I mean, Cody Schrader did. 
I mean, he was a, I, I think like a, either a two-star or a zero-star recruit coming out of high school. I mean, he played for a small university just to like continue playing football. Didn't really play at all the first three years that he was there. Ends up getting the rotational starting role that next year. Becomes a full-time starter. I think he led the, was it D2? It must have been D2. I think he led all of D2 in rushing yards that year transfers after his fourth year where he led D2 in all in, in rushing yards transfers to Missouri as a walk-on like he like he didn't even like transfer to somewhere with 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 a scholarship he walked on that first year earned a scholarship kind of was like splitting carries a little bit and then this past year they give him the starting running back job and what does he do oh he leaves the SEC in rushing yards so it's like everywhere you've given this guy the chance to be doubted outwork it and produce he absolutely has so Schrader his mentality his background I get it he's not the biggest guy he's not the fastest guy but um I just he was truly one of my guys and and he's somebody that I'd absolutely bet on to be a uh, fan favorite type of player that can be like a bottom of the roster guy or even be a rotational back at the NFL level for a small period of time so that's yeah. awesome uh, undrafted free agent signing so I do like that from him he's already a guy that you know he's becoming a fan favorite five eight and a half 202 pounds he ran a four six one at the combine uh but 2,000 yards at Truman State back in 2021 Truman State yes yeah. that's it 2,000 yards and 25 touchdowns. The first team All-American Offensive Player of the Year there uh, led the entire NCAA in rushing and then came back his last year at Missouri. He had 1,600 more yards and 14 touchdowns last year, 5.9 yards per carry. And, yep. and it's funny because Garendo started one game in college, but he was 6'1", 220, and ran 4 three, three. So there's your difference in draft stock right there. I'm pretty sure I have Cody Schrader graded higher than... Isaac Garendo on my rankings. So anyways, <laughs> getting, getting back to like the actual question of like some yeah, of my yeah. favorite picks. Um, I like a lot of them. I think this is a really solid draft for San Francisco. The two that really stand out to me that I think could be like sneaky impactful, the Dominic Pooney. I, I mean, I don't know how sneaky this is, but to me, his inside out versatility is pretty huge for this team. Maybe they have a need at right tackle, might be able to step into there. Maybe they have a bigger need on the interior. I think that he can play interior as well. I wasn't so sure of him, uh, about him succeeding at tackle at the NFL level, just because I think he's a, he's like more of a powerful offensive lineman. Um, I feel like he didn't play with great pad level when it came to like getting low and he just really just used his kind of like brute force a little bit. He was a little bit erratic for me. I know a lot of people like him and, and, and what he could be, but he was a little bit lower on my ranking. But for San Francisco specifically, that versatility of like guard and tackle, I think he's a really nice add for them. And I think he could develop into a good pro, especially um, under Shanahan's staff. And then the other one is Malik Mustafa, the safety that they drafted, I believe in the fourth round as well. And um, the reason why I like Mustafa is because when they lost... Uh, Talanova Hufonga last year to injury, I didn't feel like there was another player on the roster who could really do that job well, right? Just like this downhill robber enforcer type of a player. And that's exactly what Malik Mustafa is. And if anything were to happen to Hufonga again, Mustafa can be a really nice, okay, we still have this mold of player who can step in right away and a lot of our scheme can stay the same and we can still be aggressive over the middle. I don't love him when he's got to turn his hips and, and try to cover deep. You know, that's not where, you know, I'm, 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 I was lower on him as like a total safety than I think a lot of other people were. But the straight line downhill ability is Hufonga's style. And that is, that is, that's, I, I really like him being able to back him up there this year. Yeah, it's a good pick because I, uh, and I, I've, and I don't know why anybody would ever doubt john lynch's ability but when it comes to john lynch and, and dbs and especially the safeties uh it's gotten to the point where the 49ers no matter who they decide is is going to be a player for them turns out to be pretty good at safety so i'm going to trust him on that and uh and actually pre-draft i was like man if john lynch probably sees a guy and it puts a twinkle in his eye it might be malik mustafa and it turned out uh that they ended up drafting him in the fourth round so i did like good that one and man he is a thumper when he arrives uh the play ends it's a sound tackler he's not like a lead with the crown of your helmet knockout he wraps up he hits you with his chest and it ends with the thud like it, it, the play ends and so he's not he's not only a strong hitter, but he's a sound tackler as well, which I love. And obviously when he sees it, he triggers downhill in a heartbeat. Yeah, very quickly, very quick to get downhill. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes I will say this, he's conscious of 
wrapping up the tackle, but sometimes the shorter arms do fail him when it comes to wrapping up for those tackles. So he is. He's a guy who loves to be physical. He knows that tackling is a part of the game. It's in his DNA. I, I, when I saw him miss tackles over the last couple of years, it was kind of generally because of those shorter arms, but um, at least he is conscious of it. So he's always trying to make the most of it. All older prospects, again, that we've talked about so far. Uh, Schrader, even, you know, 25. He's going to turn 25, I think, at some he point. He is older. Yeah, at the end he of is his, much older. His he rookie season. Years in college football. Um, another one was the second round pick. Where did you have Renardo Green graded? I think Green was. Now let me let me let me pull this up because I want to make sure that I get the exact number for you. He was pretty high for me. I like Renardo Green, especially after watching him at the Shrine Bowl. I think he had a ton of confidence. Obviously, plays main coverage really really well. I had him 89th on my board, so I had him top 100. Obviously, they take him a lot earlier. They take him at 64, but I, I mean, I don't hate it. I felt like anywhere from the I feel like he could have been a third round pick basically anywhere and 64, let's face it. Okay. Second round, but you know, it's back into the second round. So we're talking basically a third round pick at that point. So, um, this is fine value for me. It was really the top end of where I thought that he could have been drafted, but just a pure man coverage dude, man. And, and I think that if the 49ers want to do more of that, then that's exactly what he's going to give. And the competitiveness of how he approaches the position is really important. I mean, when I was at the shrine bowl in Frisco, they did the like hey end of practice offense is best wide receiver defense is best corner one-on-one rep see who wins it and basically like you know quote unquote like for the practice like let's see which yeah. win in practice and it was renardo green i can't even remember the wide receiver that he was going up against it might even casey washington but Locked him down, just like absolutely locked him down and 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 shut down the play and the team got super hyped and he, he got a PBU on it, never really let the, the wide receiver get um, get anything further than a half arm's length distance away from him. And he was able to get his hand in there to uh, disrupt the pass. And so like, that's exactly what he's like. I mean, he's just sticky in man coverage. It's his style. He likes to play in press. He likes to get up in guys' face. He likes to get his hands on wide receivers. So if that's something that the 49ers want to continue to gravitate towards, you pick the exact right player to do it because that's his style and that's what he does best. Yeah, and I wonder if they might start leaning a little bit more towards some more press man looks because that's that's definitely where he shines. He's looking at the PFF grades for Green. He's like 90, uh, 90 point something uh, man coverage grades. His own grade's like 65 or something. Right. You know, There's a pretty big delta between those two grades. And, and so it'll be interesting to see how the 49ers use him. And, and a lot of these picks we're seeing with the 49ers is you know older prospects, captain types, uh ready to ready to fight it out and i think is is really important and you look at all their late round picks that they've hit on and i think they've hit on those types of players that are just wired the way they want them so i like yeah. that about uh, renardo green and, and maybe done dirty by jim Nagy. why is he a shrine guy and not a senior bowl guy because i think that was probably part of his draft stock he's like okay shrine guys go mid uh, mid middle of the draft later day three and the senior bowl guys go in rounds two and round three but uh you know, you have to talk to Jim Nagy about that one. Look, Shrine Bowl, Shrine Bowl guys are coming up, though. We've had a, we had a couple of good guys from the Shrine Bowl. I really enjoyed being at the Shrine Bowl this year. Obviously, I enjoy the Senior Bowl as well. But, like, there, there was just a lot of really great competition at both of those events. And so, Renardo Green, Renardo's uh, teammate, Jerry and Jones, like, both of those guys were were at the Shrine Bowl. Malik Washington was there as well. Taj Washington. Mm -hmm. It was a fun battle between those corners and those wide receivers at that event. More coming up with Trevor Sikama of PFF. His final grade on this 2024 San Francisco 49ers draft class. Today's episode of Locked On 49ers is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. Killer last minute deals at Game Time, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes all the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets or Major League Baseball tickets. Love being able to go to baseball games like, ah, I got the night off. I can jam into the city, go catch a Giants game. Super easy. Couple taps on the Game Time app. Those tickets are right there on the app. You don't have to go fishing through your email to find the tickets. And of course, last minute deals, even up to an hour after your event starts. Concerts comedy shows, whatever it is, theater events near you, you can find them on game time. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets 
with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Official grade, Trevor Sikkim's official grade on the 49ers. Did you have any picks that you were just like, oh, eh, I don't know about that one? No, well, no, not really. I mean, I look at their their whole draft. A lot of the guys that we have already talked about, um, you know, I, I think that they are fits for exactly what they want to do. You know, you can throw Jacob Cowing in there as well. Yeah, I, I think that this was a this is a really solid draft for them. I, I, I wanted to double check on this when you asked the question. I just looked it up really quick because I can't remember. I couldn't remember what I gave them on our show NFL Stock Exchange, and I was like, off the top of my head, I give them a B plus, and I just double checked it, and I did give them a B plus. So look at me, I know me pretty well. Um, so I, I think that this was a draft where. It felt very 49ers-esque. You know, I give him a B-plus because it's like, all right, you draft Ricky Pearsall in the first round. Um, did you really need it? Depending on what happens with the wide receivers, you know, Pooney a little bit a little bit higher than where I had him ranked. Uh, Renato Green a little bit higher than where I had him ranked. You know, Garendo probably the same thing. So I didn't give it an A because a lot of these picks were higher selections versus where they were on my big boards. So just value-wise, I kind of bring that down a little bit. But when I look at the class as a whole, it's hard for me to look at it and go, yeah, I really didn't like this haul from the Niners. In fact, I liked it quite a bit. So um, even though those guys were a little overdrafted compared to where I had him on my board, I always give some flexibility in my grading or assessment because I'm, I'm evaluating these guys in my own vacuum. The NFL teams are evaluating these guys for how they're going to fit on their team with their coaching staff and their culture. Like that's, it's, it's, it's a... I don't want to say it's a completely different thing because it's not, but there's a lot of nuance that can come here and there. So I always give a little bit of wiggle room. It's not like, oh, like Ronaldo Green, for example. I had him ranked 89th overall. Niners take him at 64. Okay, yeah, a little bit of a reach. I mean, it's more than, it's what, 25 spots ahead of, of, of where I had him ranked, but that's not that big of a deal. It's really not, especially for a team that liked him if they want to go in that direction. Yeah, so is, he, plus. is he a good player? Does he hit what you're you're trying to, to find on draft day? Right. Um, the, my, the, the thing that I came away with was like, yeah, not that I didn't like the players they drafted, but especially with the six quarterbacks going in round one, I thought there was an opportunity at the end of round one to be like, oh man, this guy's here. And I can't believe he's still on the board for us. And I think a lot of teams kind of had that at the end of round one, when especially those extra couple of quarterbacks go that they probably didn't factor into what was going to be available for them in their first round, but for the 49ers, you know, at 31 with Pearsall, I don't think John Lynch turned to Kyle Shannon. He goes, oh, I can't believe Ricky Pearsall still on the board for us at pick 31, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have that opportunity to be like, man. And, and I was looking at, you know, Johnny Newton, who I, if I'm not mistaken, is one of your favorites in this draft. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kool-Aid was out there. If you're, if you, if you really want to get a corner early, it's not that I didn't like Pearsall. I was like, man, there was just some other names on the board that I, I wasn't sure we're going to get to where the 49ers were at 31. Yeah. Those were the two that I would have said immediately that were the two that were still on the board at that point at 31 one where you go okay wow this guy made it to us and obviously they they pass on him those guys end up going early you know second round anyways and um maybe jackson powers johnson was another guy like that if, yeah if cooper de really was still there he, he cooper would be Jean, obviously yeah. still there too so yeah I, I mean i i think i was the most shocked that johnny newton um was still on the board that was that was that was pretty crazy to me i think washington got an absolute steal and he was a top 12 player for me so that was the one but all the other ones i can be like eh yeah, I, I, I thought there was a world where they could have absolutely gone in the first round, but I get there's only 32 picks that can happen in the first round, so somebody's got to be left out. And it was a really good draft class overall, so it makes sense. Fantastic stuff, Trevor. Uh, I was just thinking back the other day, if you remember when you were hosting Locked On NFL Draft and you know pre-draft you would have some other hosts and some other folks go come on and do a mock draft and pick for their teams. And so we did a 49ers mock draft. And it was on, I, I remember the date because of what happened the next day. It was March 25th, 2021. And we did a little mock draft. I was picking for the 49ers. You know, great podcast. We're all done. You know, see you later, guys. Okay, go to bed. Wake up in the morning. 49ers trade three first round picks to move up in the draft with the Miami Dolphins and go get a quarterback. And I was like, wow, I botched that because my big take was, hey, don't you know? Look out for maybe quarterback at twelve, but uh, they might even you know want to trade up a little bit, a couple spots. You now, called it then, you but but it. I 
But I said, but there's no way they're going to be trading like a future first or something to go way up. So one of these guys has to fall a little bit. And uh, just look, clip, just clip the first part. Of the show. <laughs> exactly. Just could just, just clip that part. Exactly. So hey, my strategy looking back was better though. Anyway, so um, maybe they shouldn't have spent all those first round picks because this is the first pick they've had since then in the first round since Trey Lance. But uh, that one hit me the other day, and that, and that was fun. It was always fun talking to you guys on. Locked on NFL draft, but uh, proud of you, buddy. I love seeing what you're doing now at PFF, doing big things. If you guys aren't following Trevor, you must at Tampa Bay Trey on Twitter. Trevor Sikma, lead NFL draft analyst at Pro Football Focus. Fantastic stuff. Great draft season, Trevor. Hope you get some much due time off here pretty soon. It is always good to come back on here, visit with you, talk some football, Brian. I appreciate it, my friend, anytime. Uh, now I'm going to remember that date always uh, because of because of what you said there. That is that is funny, but uh, always good to be with you, my friend. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts. I'll be back with Croc tomorrow right here, Locked on 49ers.